Hi, welcome to the noise path. Here in the lab, there are often little upkeeps and services that need to happen to various instruments to make sure things are running smoothly. Now, I don't normally record that because I'm not sure if you would find it interesting, but this time I thought, let's give it a try and see what the feedback is. There are two instruments that need attention today. One of them is this HP 3558A, which is of course an eight and a half digit multimeter. We've done repairs and teardowns of these instruments before. And this particular one has a fairly simple problem. So if we turn it on, it will become very quickly obvious what the issue is. So after it tests the hardware, it's going to generate a little error. There it is. Now, if you look at the error, actually, we can see that the error is a system error, and that is a non-volatile RAM error. So this is quite common in some of the earlier versions of this instrument that uses a battery backup to maintain various RAM functions. And some of it can be serious, because one of those actually holds the calibration data, which if you lose, of course, you lose the calibration information. And it's always good to make sure that that is repaired. There are several ways to do this. So let's go ahead and dig in and quickly fix this problem. And removing the top cover, we see a whole bunch of familiar packages and devices. So here we have a cluster of six UV erasable memory. This is where the firmware of the instrument actually lives. If these are corrupted at any time, the instrument wouldn't even really boot or it will do something really unusual, but easily reprogrammable if you get a hold of the firmware. Then over here, we have a cluster of four SRAMs, I think, and this is for acquisition memory. In fact, this one looks like it has the extended version of that. These are not battery backup. You turn it off, everything goes away. And then we get to the battery backup devices. Here we have 28 pin Dallas, I think these are 256K memory. These have a battery built into the package, and that's what holds onto that memory, because SRAM, otherwise it's just non-volatile. Now the problem is that the battery here has died, and the error you're seeing is actually associated with these two ICs. It, this is not really critical for the function of the instrument, because it's just holding user functions and various settings between power cycles of the unit. But the one over here, which is a 24-bit Dallas one, this one holds the calibration data. If this one dies and the battery dies, then you lose all of your calibration, and we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. Luckily, this one still is intact. Now, these are date-coded 1988, and the fact that they're still working, this is well above their shelf life. It's quite impressive. Now, do you have a few options replacing these? Some people have replaced them with FRAM, and you can do this, but really, these are still manufactured either through some different brand, or you can even get them. So I'm just going to simply get an equivalent one. They're not actually that cheap. I think $30 or so per chip, which is quite expensive. But nonetheless, if you replace those and put them in a socket, you know, you, this is going to be good for at least another 10 years. So that's the route we're going to take. And we've taken out all of the battery backup memory. You can see the one that has the calibration. I've put it into a USB universal program. It allows me to extract the content. Now, this is not the only way to extract the calibration coefficients of the instrument. You can actually do it through the GPIB port and some software. But since we already have it out there, it's pretty easy to just read it out and then save it as a bin file, and then we can program the new chip with it. These two that have the user coefficients, there is no reason reading them anyway because they're corrupted and they don't really have any useful information at the moment. This is the critical part. And with the part in the programmer, like so, we should be able to easily read the content. You can see I've selected the part number over here, and we're just going to go read, and there it is. Let's see, here we go. Here's a whole bunch of you know, hex data. That is the calibration coefficients, and that is the majority of the chip is actually occupied by that. That's it. Now we save this into a bin file, and we can reprogram the next part, and then we are back in business. So everything is now socketed. These two new SRAMs with the battery backup have solved the initial startup problem, as we will see. And we're going to download the content of this into a new one. And then if everything is up and running, we'll do an ACAL and a quick verification. All right, all back together now. Let's see if that error is gone. Testing hardware. And there it is. Pretty good. So we'll let it warm up, and we'll run an ACAL. And then I'm going to test it against a reference. Now, just a really quick performance check. This is not even a very good cable for this, but nonetheless, we can just quickly make sure everything is working. This is set to one volt, and look at that. That's a lot of zeros. Let's try five volt over here. Here is five volt, and there it is. Looks pretty good as well. And 10 volt, that should also be very good. And I think this goes to 100, 100 volts. There's 100 volts. Yeah, looks pretty good. And the voltage, we can do a couple of resistances as well. Now for resistance, I'm not even using a four wire measurement. We're just going to quickly check to see if it's working. So this is a short in this reading 0.3. That's just the resistance of the interconnect. So if I go to one ohm, for example, it should be 0.996. And if you subtract that, it's almost exactly correct. And if we go to one kilo ohm over here, there you go. That's pretty good. That's our offset right there at the end, still present. And then we go to 10 kilo ohm and it looks good. We go to one mega ohm. The one megaohm is going to have a lot of uncertainty on it. Just moving this cable is going to make a difference, as you can see. But again, we're not doing a complete check. Just wanted to make sure the calibration coefficients haven't disappeared. And for DC current, things are also looking good. So here's one milliamp. It looks perfect. We can try 100 microamp as well. Here's 100 microamp. Looks good. And let's try 10 milliamp. 
just for the sake of completeness here, and here's 10 milliamp. Yep, it's working. And the second instrument that needs some attention is this Agilent MSO 9404A, which is a 4 GHz 4 channel oscilloscope, 20 giga sample per second, pretty useful and definitely worth fixing. Now this has a very simple problem. You can see that when it boots up, it says that the default settings are loaded and that's because the BIOS battery essentially has run out. And it's quite annoying that this comes up every time you essentially you plug it in. It doesn't really do anything else aside from maybe interfering with some licenses and so on that are time sensitive because the clock is obviously gone. So let's open it up and replace the CMOS battery. And here's the back of the instrument off, and we have a direct access to the motherboard, which is nice because you can change things like the RAM if you ever need to, clean up the fans and so on. And here's our BIOS battery right there. Now looking at this, it looks like that the interface between the acquisition board, which is right down here, to the motherboard is through some kind of a SATA similar to a SATA connector. I think that's what's going on because I don't see any PCI Express connection between the acquisition board and the motherboard itself. This also means that potentially you could change this motherboard to a newer one. I think there are some upgrade paths that used to be available for these kind of instruments. This, I think, is a Windows XP and then you know, Windows 7 and so on. And then look at these power cables, two huge power cables coming from the main power supply into the acquisition board. All the power comes from there. It's a little messy in terms of cable management, but really what they've done is that they've completely separated the PC from the acquisition, which is a very common thing nowadays because then you can engineer them separately. You just treat this like a regular you know, computer. You can run Linux, you can run Windows, most of the time Windows in these instruments. So it should be no issue. Let's get remove the battery over there, make sure it's really empty, and then replace it. So the replacement, of course, fixes the clock issue, so the BIOS works. The instrument also passes self-test, but really you have to run the calibration. The calibration uses an internal signal, and then it passes it to each of the channels individually. It takes a very long time, but then it uh, does all the leveling and all the calibration of the internal ADCs, the front end amps, and zero offsets, and all of that. And that's pretty critical, because if anything goes wrong in that, let's say something is outside of range, you'll know that something is wrong with the acquisition or the front end. So let's run that next. So it looks like that this thing has not had this calibration routine ran since 2010. That's quite a long time ago. And now this is not because of the BIOS battery. The BIOS actually defaults to 2006. So this, this is an instrument is actually older than that. So yeah, so we're going to have to run that and see what happens. There's also a time scale cal. I'm not sure if I'm going to do that. Let's see what it asks for. But if you go ahead and start this, you can see it tells you to disconnect everything. It takes about 62 minutes. Yeah, it's going to take a while, but we have to go through it. Well, it looks like we get the option pretty early on. So we can do the standard calibration, which is all the amplitude cals, and then we can do the standard plus time scale, and that's going to require an accurate 10 megahertz source, or just do a standard and then reset the time scale to factory setting. Well, since we're going through all this trouble, we may as well try the standard plus time, because I'm sure I can get one of the rubidium standards and then give ourselves a 10 megahertz reference, and that should be pretty good for this. So let's go with that, select that. And then it's going to go through it. It's going to also require this cable that comes with these instruments. It's a fairly good cable, good quality cable to connect the auxiliary to the individual channels for the amplitude calibration. And it's going to ask you when to connect that to the front panel. So now in this step, the instrument is asking for a 10 megahertz accurate reference. So I have a warmed up rubidium source over here. We've used this on the lab for several other kind of applications before. And the 10 megahertz directly going into channel one. What it's going to do is going to measure that against its own internal reference essentially. And then it's going to calibrate until they match. And then it's going to record those calibration coefficients for the OCSO that's in here. And it's going to match the rubidium, which is going to be a 10 megahertz reference. And the last step of the calibration is on the digital channel. This is particularly annoying because this little adapter over here, as shown in this picture, tends to get lost. And then you will not really be able to directly connect this. You have to hack something together. But luckily, I have that here. So we should be able to do this final calibration step as well. And there we go. Successful. Everything, including the time scale. We close that. Turn all the channels on. And it should be fully functional. There you go. Miss channel 2. There it is. Pretty nice. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this quick lab upkeep video. If you like these kind of things, let me know in the comment section. And depending on how this video does, I'll decide perhaps to do more of these little quick maintenances around the lab. I'll see you next time.